for being here and uh, listening to my talk. I'm going to tell you a little bit about Test the Web Forward. Um, it's a really cool movement. Um, and I, I just want to get a quick show of hands. Has anybody here, who's heard of Test the Web Forward? All right, a few. Has anybody been to an event? Yeah, I see. So I know some of you. Um, cool. So most of you haven't. Um, I'm, I'm going to tell you a little bit about, about what it is, how it got started. Um, and what we do there. And hopefully, for those of you who've never been to one or don't know, I'll, I'll entice you to join the movement. So a little bit about me. My name's Rebecca Houck. I work for Adobe, and I just said I've been there for eight years. I work here in the San Francisco office down on Townsend Street. Um, I'm on the web platform team, and I've been deeply involved with Tesla Web Forward since the beginning. So I'm going to start out with a quote from Tim Berners-Lee because it really captures the essence of what, of what Test the Web Forward is. Um, he said, if I had taken proprietary control of the web, then it never would have taken off. People only committed their time because they knew it was open and shared and that they could help decide what happened next. So his vision for the web was not just a technological vision, but an evolutionary vision. And so now we are almost 25 years later after he invented the web, and we've seen prolific growth, exponential growth from many millions of people, contributions, of technology, ideas, content, everything. And his evolutionary vision came true because the web today really, truly is defined by the community. Um, but he also realized uh, very soon after that in order for it to prevent it from, from fragmenting and becoming utter chaos, there needed to be a common set of standards around which the web developed and, and advanced to keep it somewhat sane. So he, in 1994, founded the World Wide Web Consortium, which we know as the W3C for short, uh, as the standards body for the web. And it's the root of communication for how we develop the web and advance it. And just like communication is how we, as people, come together, Standards bring people together on the web. So what exactly is a standard? Well, at the very basic definition, it's defined some, how something should work. Um, it's based in the W3C, it's based on the consensus of community. Um, all decisions of how things are done are consensus based. There's no central authoritative figure. Um, and often it's a lot of iterations before we can come to agreement. It's, it's a little like a, a, a legislative process that we're familiar with in, in government. Uh, a standard has to be theoretically possible to implement. It always starts as an idea, but it has to be feasible and theoretical. You can't hear me back there? OK. Better. Um, and so this is really important. It also has to be implemented more than once. If you implement a standard just once and you can't repeat it, then it's an anomaly or it's not standardizable because maybe there's too many variables to keep control of or to define. And this is the important part. The implementations have to pass a common test suite. So how do you know that you're conforming to the standard? Well, there's, there's, a, there's a set of tests that everybody that comes along that implements has to, has to pass. So how do standards come to be? I'm going to go through a very high level, very quick overview of, of the process. Um, and and this, is the, this is the desired process. And I'm going to point out here that sometimes in reality, we veer away from the desired process a little bit. Um, a standard always starts as a draft. Um, a draft is a work in progress. Uh, there's multiple updates to a standard, usually quite a lot of them over in many cases, a, a long period of time, sometimes a couple of years. Um, here, prototyping and early implementation begins. So, so this is where we deviate a little bit from what is desired to what actually happens. So a lot of the things in, in the W3C that are standards in draft form are in shipping browsers. And that's because we're really hungry for the new technology. We really want to get it out there and in people's hands. It's because we want people to try it out and give us feedback so that we can make it better with, with the caveat that we know that it's a standard and it might change. Um, and, and, and it's because we can't keep up with the process. The, 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 the innovation is so fast that we, we need to keep up with it. So that's partly why we're, we're getting, have, have this Tesla Web Forward movement, is we want to streamline that process. We want to bring more people on and, and maybe pull those two timelines a little closer together. The draft also advances on consensus. Um, the working groups meet regularly and have discussions every day about every detail and every letter of every spec. And it's quite fascinating if you follow any of them. <laughs> um, tests are needed in this phase. Um, 
for the proof of concept, to resolve the details, um, and, and really, again, because these are things that are shipping in browsers, so these tests kind of go beyond proving concept and serve as the, as the functional tests for the software in a lot of cases. So the next phase is the candidate recommendation phase, and this is where it, this, the, the draft becomes a little more stable and a little more firm. Um, the working group at this point believes that the spec has everything that it needs. Um, here, the implementations are needed to validate the belief that the spec is ready. Uh, and again, tests are needed here so the implementations can start on the ground, start being interoperable from the start. And also, the tests are required for the implementations to pass so that it can get to the final recommendation version. Um, when there, it becomes a recommendation when there are two or more implementations, because like I said before, that, that validates it as a standard when two people, at least two organizations can do it. Um, all implementations pass the same suite of tests, and future implementations or future versions of those implementations can still use the same test suite to continue to prove conformance. So Toby Langell from Facebook, and now he's the test lead at the W3C, and Robin Berjan, who's an editor on the HTML5 spec, have been doing some work recently to generate some coverage statistics on the specs. Um, since we're probably all familiar with code coverage, this is different because there's no code, it's just words, it's specs. So they've come up with an algorithm that parses the language of the specs, uh, does some word counting and word analysis, um, we've, got, we've got details at the spec section level, and they're doing this to try to figure out how, where are we with HTML5, how much more do we have to go, what do we need? Um, and I'm not sure if you can see the number up there, but uh, we are at 37% coverage currently on HTML5. So we're not even halfway there with the test suite. Um, we feel like we need about 25,000 tests. Um, we currently have about 10, which means we need over 15,000 more tests to get HTML there. Um, additionally, all these tests need to be looked at by somebody and reviewed. So there are, someone needs to look at each one of those tests to say, yep, this is good, this will prove conformance. There's about 6,000 tests sitting in that queue. Yeah, let's hope that in for a minute. Um, so, those are huge numbers and scary, and bear in mind, that's one spec. Granted, it's the biggest spec, it's HTML5, but there are so many W3C specs and a lot of them have the same story. Uh, so it may seem like it's an enormous mountain to climb. And I, I, you get your point how the hell are we going to get there? Like, well, how are we going to do this? Well, what we need is easy. We need more people, we need more tests, and we need to do it so we ultimately have a better web. So about a year ago, my colleagues at Adobe started a movement, and we called it Test the Web Forward. Um, it was intended to be a grassroots community-based movement. Uh, we had our first event in San Francisco last June, and since it was the very first one and it was kind of this cutesy name with these cool little dinosaurs, um, I, I, I remember thinking kind of myself, the enthusiasm was huge. People came in, the, the W3C staff came in, we had a spec editor travel to be here, we had this cool hackathon at our office and the food was great, um, but, but before that, like all the excitement I thought, how, they were so excited kind of over nothing because it was just an idea at that point. Like I, I thought it was interesting, but the idea was so good and it was so, when you, it was a really a proof that when you can just rally people and you can give a good idea and everyone showed up and contributed and it was great. So it took off from there. We had a few more events. We had one in Beijing last fall, uh, shortly followed by uh, one in Paris that was a lot of fun, Sydney, Australia earlier this year, and just a couple of weeks ago up in Seattle. And more in the pipeline. We just opened up registration for our Tokyo event uh, this June. Um, we opened it up yesterday and it filled up within 12 hours. So I guess you could say we're big in Japan. <laughs> uh, and we also have Shanghai and Shenzhen, China coming later this year. So we didn't do this alone. This was truly a community effort. And our very good friends at Google, Microsoft, Facebook, the W3C, a lot of other small, smaller organizations contributed money, expertise, people, time, um, and people showed up, the web development, the people who work at the small web development shops, students came. It, it, it's been really, really cool and a truly community-based effort. 
And we have a lot more coming soon. Every time we announce a new event, just yesterday we announced Tokyo and someone shouted out, bring it to Singapore. You know, we have somebody asking to bring it to Germany. So people are, people are clamoring to have this come to their community. So what happens at these events? Well, it's your kind of unusual hackathon stuff. There's a light show, there's a DJ, there's dancing till four in the morning. But there's also learning. We teach you a lot at these events. We get you started. They're typically spread over two days. It's a Friday evening of a few tech talks, three or four hours, tech talks and beer, of course. Um, we teach you everything you need to know to get started. So experts come in and, and we, get you, we teach you like how to read a W3C specs. Believe it or not, there's a skill to it. They're written in a certain language um, and there's certain ways that you can pull out testable assertions. Um, we teach you how to test with Test Harness JS. That's the W3C's preferred JavaScript testing framework. Uh, we teach you how to write a W3C ref test. Those are good tests. That's a good test format to use when you're, you need to do visual verification and how something looks or is rendered on a page. Filing the best bugs. There's a skill to that too. A good bug versus a bad bug may mean one that gets fixed or one that doesn't. Um, some of the working groups have really cool test frameworks. Uh, the CSS working group has a beautiful uh, test case management system and sometimes we'll do a talk walking you through that if we're doing a lot of focus on CSS testing. And then you get the experts here. So they'll give you a snapshot of what's going on. What's, this, what's the state of this spec right now? So like I kind of just gave you a snapshot of HTML5. You, know, you can talk to the editors. You can talk to the people who are running the testing efforts on those and, and learn. So I'm going to walk you through a very brief excerpt of one of the uh, talks that we give, and that's how to give a ref test. Um, these are the actual slides that we use. I, I just shortened them a bit, but just kind of give you an idea of what they are. So the full tutorial is on our website at testthewebforward.org, and it's under resources. Um, it's there available. There's sample files that go along with it, and it's designed for you to do it at home on your own. So a ref test. Does anybody know what a ref test is? Have you heard of ref tests? Sweet. Nobody. Cool. Um, not, well, not wasting my time. <laughs> um, a ref test is something that you, you would choose to use a ref test versus a JavaScript test when you, when you have something visual that you need to verify. You need to make sure that something is rendered properly on the page. You can't always do that programmatically with JavaScript. You can ask JavaScript where something is and what color it is, but you can't see it. Um, so ref test is good for that. And historically in software testing, when we, when we have to verify UI, we'll do some kind of screenshot image comparison. And there's managing big libraries of screenshots. And then if one little pixel changes in your UI, you've got to rebaseline everything. And then you're nodding your head because you've been through this before. It's a nightmare. Um, well, the ref test operates on the same screenshot idea, um, except they're much lighter weight. There are two test files, two files rather. It's one that's a test file and one that's a reference file. The test file is the one that uses the feature you're testing. The reference file is something that is going to look exactly the same way. You're going to construct it differently, not using the feature you're testing. A good ref test is self-describing. You put a sentence on the page so that if someone manually wants to look at the test, you can say that the test passes if this. Um, but they also are designed to work with automation. So uh, Mozilla, IE, uh, Blink, WebKit, all have, <laughs> all have uh, uh, support in their testing, internal testing tools to, for, for ref tests. So they basically will run them in an automated engine where they'll load each HTML file, take a quick screen grab, do the image comparison, and then if everything passes, they pitch out the results. Um, much better than maintaining huge libraries of images for all the platforms and then the, the nightmare of rebaselining. So they're cross-browser and they're cross-platform. So this is a sample test case and this comes from an actual spec and this is the CSS transform spec. Um, and this is, a, this is actually an example. When you're, when you're getting started with writing W3C tests, it's really good to start with the examples because you've got images that you can see how something looks. You almost always have code there. Um, and if a specs example doesn't pass a test, then that's flag one. We want to test the stuff we're demonstrating. So this here is a transform. This is a CSS pro transform property that takes a translate function that has two arguments. It's the x and the y. So this says right here, the transform is going to be moved by 100 pixels in the x direction and in the y direction. 
So I'm going to start with showing you the completed ref test, um, just so that you can visualize this as we walk through the code. So this is, looks like the same, but these are the two separate files. The top file is the test file, and the bottom file is the reference tile, file. They're the same. Um, the W3C requires you to put a little metadata in the top of your test, um, you know, a title for the page telling basically what the test is, um, who you are so that we know who to follow up with when we review tests and so that you get credit for your contributions. Um, the next two links are spec links. Um, this is something that CSS Working Group does to track what section of the spec you're testing. So some of that spec section level coverage data that we know is mapped back this way so we can programmatically extract it. Um, and then the match uh, reference, the last link is what identifies this, I'm sorry, the second to last link, is what identifies this as a, as a reference test. It says, this, hey, this is the file that matches this test file. And then the last, is the assertion in the spec that you're testing. So in this case, it's verbatim from the spec. The transform moves the element by 100 pixels in both the x and y direction. So under the test file, we're gonna now add the element with the transform applied. And since it's, it needs to be a green square, it's gonna be a div, but it needs to be a green square. So we need to put the styles on there to make it with the green background. And we're gonna make it 100 pixels by 100 pixels. And then the last line there is, is that's the test. Over in the reference file, we create the exact same identical rendering, only rather than move, putting the, positioning the square, the, it, the div in that, using a transform, we just simply set the top and the left to 100 by 100. Now this is a cool technique that we use a lot in ref tests, that where we put something red on the test that if it fails, the red appears, and if it passes, there's no red. Um, again, really nice for somebody who's coming on and looking at the test and that you'll see in the statement will say we shouldn't see red when this fails. Um, so here we create a, a red square of the same size that is going to be positioned beneath the green square if the green square properly transforms into the right position. And then in both of these, since these are pages and they're gonna be compared programmatically probably in somebody's automated engine, you gotta put the same sentence in both. Test passes if there's a green square and no red. And, and one of the guidelines I've been told when writing these tests is your grandma should be able to look at that and know if it passes. My grandma could probably say yes or no, maybe. She could open the browser. <laughs> um, and then the last thing, you put your divs on the file. And the only thing to note here is you want to put your red square first before your green square, so it's, it, or before, in the, so that the green square will get rendered on top of it, just as following the DOM order. And then this is your reference div. And so this is what a failing test and a pass, passing test looks like. And, and we were, the first, the top test I showed you in the beginning, and the bottom test is one where the, the transform failed, it didn't, didn't get applied, and oh, there's the red. So my grandmother could totally say fail. So that's it, that's the basics of a ref test. And we go through this at these events, we do ref tests, we do, and we do a little deeper, we've got people you know, hands on, we've got sample materials and everything, and we do it for JavaScript tests as well. And then we move on to hacking. And that's what's really fun. And we spend all day hacking. Um, people hive and they form groups and they, they huddle around specs and they come up with testing plans. Um, and in the past, we've written tests for HTML5, transforms, backgrounds and borders, CSS values and units. Uh, up in Seattle, we had a cool group doing pointer events, which that spec is moving along really rapidly. Um, some of the web apps uh, and some guys uh, it came to our Paris event from Sweden and did some WebRTC testing, which was cool and unusual. And then, of course, the people are contributing. Every, every test we write is a contribution to the W3C. So to date, uh, over actually, it's probably more like over 1,300 tests at this point. Um, Every event we find interoperability bugs. If you've ever loaded a web page in multiple browsers, this probably isn't a surprise. They look different, and these are the kinds of things we're trying to, we want them to look the same. Um, we had a really cool one in Seattle a couple of weeks ago where the guy loaded his tests, his JavaScript tests, in three different browsers. They all had different results, and none of them had it right. The spec was very clear, all three were wrong, and all three were different from each other. And if anybody's done web development, this should come as no surprise to you. <laughs> and this is exactly the kind of stuff that we're trying to get at. We also find spec bugs. They're totally up for scrutiny too. It's entirely possible with all the iterations and all the arguments and all the changes and 
you know, even if it's as simple as typos or inconsistencies, um, there's a bug database and a process for that. And, and believe me, the editors would love to have this feedback. They would love people looking at their specs because ultimately it only makes it better. Um, we've had some people come and convert their own test suites. If you work for a smaller shop and you've got tests that you think are valuable that you could want to contribute back, come to an event, convert them, do them on your own. Um, we had the uh, PhoneGap guys did the, converted in the Paris event the uh, Cordova test suite and contributed it back. And it was not that much. It was a day of about five guys that got around and converted theirs from their format. They used Jasmine into Test Harness JS format. And I know there's lots of other test suites out there. Um, so that's a, a really good, because it's not really doing a whole lot of extra work, maybe spending a day tweaking things to make them fit into the W3C way. And by the way, if there's a lot of those out there, the W3C is open to bending their ways and accepting other formats. Like, you know, if there were a ton of Jasmine tests out there, maybe we can, okay, we'll accept Jasmine tests as is and we'll, we'll make a process for accepting those. Um, I've seen uh, test infrastructure hacking projects going on. The, the guy, the author uh, who wrote Test Harness JS is from Opera, James Graham. Um, he had a, a group of guys and they were making improvements and enhancements to the harness at one of the events. So, so that counts too. And then we have experts that come to these events and everybody prepares and makes tutorials and documentation and materials and we're starting to really develop a nice library of information and, and good stuff. And with Tokyo coming up, we'll probably have some Japanese content and we have, we have from our, Shen, our uh, Beijing event. So even, even starting to get organically localized just by the process of being in these other countries. And then we're building community. I mean, we're all here tonight. We're all part of the same community. ZFA events are super fun. I mean, there's food is always really good. There's always stuff to drink. Um, there's a, a sense of that you did something to, to advance the web at the end of it. You make good friends, you network. They're awesome. These are some photos from Beijing and San Francisco and Paris. And I didn't have time to get any Seattle photos in there, but um, we tweeted some from the account. And uh, there's, a, there's a blog out there on Adobe's web platform blog. And so yay, we're making the web a better place. All right, so I'm going to take you to Paris for two minutes um, and let you get a glimpse of what that event was like. This is a video that really sums it up, and um, it was a really good time. So I encourage you all to join the movement. Um, come to an event if it comes to your city or somewhere you're traveling to. 
Um, there's lots of sponsorship opportunities, big and small. You don't have to have gobs of cash. Little tiny things you can do to make the event better. It's truly community-based. Um, you can host your own event. Um, they also don't need to be huge two-day events. We can, we're, we're looking to do more sm smaller like meetups, maybe you know, 50 people or 100 people in somebody's office for one evening. Um, you don't have to do any of this. If you, you can just write tests. There's materials out there. There's ways to get involved. So you can visit our website, testthewebforward.org. Uh, we have a uh, W3C mailing list that you can subscribe to tonight if you want to see me or Larry McLister after this. Um, follow us on Twitter, of course. Our hashtag is testtwf. And my name is Rebecca Hauck. Thank you very much.